My name is Peter Schrever. I work for NVIDIA. I used to work for Nokia on power management. I still work on power management, but these days for Tegra, for NVIDIA Tegra chips. So the let's make forward. Yeah, so the goal of this talk is to explain how, from the hardware level upwards, how power consumption in CMOS chips works. And then how can we manage power? How can we make a balance between power and performance? So I will start from the lowest level transistors, then go up to then, then try to f then explain what hardware techniques can be used to save power, at the, what techniques at the RTL, VHDL, very low level can be used, then, uh, and then go upwards to kernel level software, user space, and user space software. In this I wrote this talk for a one hour time slot, so I might have to skip some of the bits left and right, I'm because we apparently we only have 45 minutes. So, start from the beginning, the MOSFET is basically the, it's a transistor which is optimized to be used as a switch, and it's basically the basis, the, the basis of every silicon, uh, in, uh, every integrated circuit, basically, well, every digital integrated circuit. So the the most imp yeah so there's the if you apply a a, a voltage at the gate then there then you can actually then the current will flow between source and drain basically so if you if you know classical transistors you might remember these things as base collector and emitter in MOSFETs world they are called gate source and drain but they basically conceptually do the same thing. The most important thing about this picture, or one another important thing about this picture, to notice is the L parameter, which is basically what they call the channel length. And the channel length has some influence on power consumption of MOSFETs. So there are two, w there, there are two basic things in power consumption in MOSFETs. There is a dynamic power, which happens when you actually switch or change the switch state, and that is a static power, which is always there even if you don't actually do anything. So the dynamic power is mostly because of the capacitance. Every time you change the switch, you have to charge or uncharge the capacitor, the, the small capacitance inside the, inside the MOSFET. And it's about, yeah, it's, so it's um, corresponds to, it's voltage squared and it's linear, in, it's almost, it's, has a really relationship with the frequency at which you switch the, uh, the MOSFETs. The leakage power has different causes. So the point is that even though it's a switch, it's not a perfect switch. So that means that even if you if you apply a voltage at the source and the gate is low, so in theory there shouldn't be flowing any, any current, that, that's not actually really true. There, there is always a little leakage current, which which makes it, which makes causes static power consumption even if you don't actually switch. So there are uh, each of those drain gate junctions can actually leak, and they they all have a different they all have different properties. More important thing, um, because it is so, yeah. So the it, the drain leakage is important because the threshold because it's related to the threshold voltage. The threshold voltage is a voltage where the switch goes into in where the switch basically is closed so the current can actually flow so as soon as the voltage at the gate ri rises beyond, beyond a certain level what they call the threshold voltage then the switch is considered closed and the current will flow the threshold voltage is going down quite rapidly as we no as we have newer pros so it i mean today uh, it's it's somewhere, it's easy to 800 volts. And it used to be much higher, actually. You kind, of, you kind of sort of think that if you have been following electronics a little bit, you might have realized that it, in, the 90, in the 80s, we all had 5 volt DTL logic. Now we have 3.3, 1.8. And that's all because of these lowering threshold voltages. And then there is a DIBL effect, which basically causes the the leakage current in 
um, increases with the drain voltage and it is also dependent on the channel length, which means that because the, if the, the channel length is shorter, then the drain leakage goes up and the channel length, you want the channel length to be shorter because then your transistors can be faster. The net result of all this is that the drain leakage power increases exponentially with supply voltage, which is why you want to keep the supply voltage low, and also with the threshold voltage. Um, I mean, with the yeah, so with the lower threshold voltage, you want a low threshold voltage because th then you can switch faster. However, that also causes your static power consumption to raise. The gate leakage is a bit simpler. It basically only scales with supply voltage, which means that you have to try to keep your supply voltage low. So what can we do at the MOSFET level to actually save power? How can we change the properties of the MOSFETs to, to have to optimal choose a balance between power and performance? So one thing you can do is have different threshold voltages. Not, not, not all the MOSFETs in, in the chip have to have the same threshold voltage. There are some techniques you can use to have um, to, to change those threshold voltages, basically. Which means that parts of the chip which don't have to be very fast can be done with higher threshold voltage transistors. And the parts which have to be fast, like your ALU or, or the high-speed the high parts <coughs> of the uh, CPU or GPU, <coughs> they can then be uh, implemented using higher, uh, lower VT transistors, which are faster. They can also have different supply voltages. Not, all the, not the whole chip needs to be done from the same voltage. Um, and again, you have there are several things you can do with <coughs> depending on the higher <coughs> power, um, higher performance part, which was most important. The problem with that is, of course, that you have to have level shifters because you don't, your, your chip doesn't draw a single focus from it anymore, so you have to change the focus inside the chip. And it makes the physical layout of the chip more complicated. And the last thing you can do is, of course, what Intel did with the so called TD transistor, it's called the FinFET, where they basically Changed which gives them, reduces many of these leakage problems we have today. Also, TSMC is working on that, but that's only going to be for the next six So, what else can we do? So, um, chips are basically designed in sort of layers. So, we have a, so the, the, the Digital designers write code in very well at VHDL or, or some, some of one of some RTL like language. And that then gets translated into logic gates. And those logic logic gates get mapped onto um, onto actual transistors. Of course th this is all done with software, but people who the teams who work on these various steps are not necessarily composed of the same people. It's not it's not the hardware So one thing you can do is, if you have a, if you have many gate, there is, there is a, you can make a trade-off between what they call complex gate, which means it has many inputs, an AND gate with five inputs, for example, but you can also implement the same thing with AND gates in cascade, in cascade mode. You take two AND, you take an AND port, the two inputs, and then you feed the output into the next AND, AND gate, and so on. The advantage of having what they call complex gates is that they are lower capacity, which means they are also less power, but they are also slow. So that's why you can choose your gate size again in the function of what you want, what, what the required performance that is. So you can basically treat, uh, treat, do a leakage voltage trade off. So you can, uh, and you can make a trade-off between static and dynamic power. Depending on the part is going to be on all the time, then you probably want to optimize for static power to take some performance. So how is this done in actual hardware? Um, so in OMAP has uh, also OMAP at least since version three, and but also the newer version something called Smarty. 
defects. So they try to actually measure the performance of, this, of the silicon at a certain voltage level. And if, if they see that there is a margin, then they will try then they will call it dynamically low, lower the, the supply voltage to minimize problem. Um, They use basically a ring oscillator. So they have a ring oscillator which is composed of parts which are the slowest parts in the, the silicon design. And by measuring the performance of the ring oscillator at given voltage, which is the same voltage than the rest of that voltage so maybe it's running at, they can sort of find out how far, how much margin that is that is running. Um Tega 3 does it has use uses these transistor tricks to have the same A9 codex A9 core in a slower but less leaky process and then in a faster but more leaky process and then, and then they switch in, in, on a software control between the 1 and the 4 C, CPU uh, cluster depending on performance required so if the system is mostly idle and doesn't need to do much they switch to the 1 CPU and turn off the 4 faster but what power consumes. So what else can you do? If you go up if you go up from the transistor and the gate level, you can also design your hardware to be more power efficient. So you can do that for example by using token. Let's see. So, if you increase concurrency, you can ma you mo you you can try to obtain the required performance level at a lower clock. And as we know, lower clocks can mean lower voltages and means fewer power, lower power consumption. What you can also do is what they call so. If if you can't actually if the process you ha you ha you have to do is so slow that you can't really run it slower than what you can do is m what they call multiplex the hardware so use the same hardware block for different purposes <coughs> in general um, if if you can match the ha the the way what need the computations which need to be done if you can match the hardware better li like build a well, build dedicated hardware pipelines you can also improve the uh, efficiency our way. And of course, local memories, because if you have local memory, you don't have to drive lines, longer lines across the ship, and you save power that way. But unfortunately, as we all know, concurrency is a hard problem, and there's some problems are inherently not parallelizable. So this strategy works for very well for some things, like graphics and video, video coding work and audio coding work, but it doesn't really work for, oh, so there are some things like sorting which don't really work very well in parallel. So examples of co hardware which uses this strategy are of course specialized cores like GPUs, Epiphany and other parallel designs. A dedicated hardware, most mobile chips have, or I think almost all mobile chips, have dedicated hardware for video encoding and decoding because it's a process which can be efficiently parallelized and mapped onto hardware, which makes it more efficient than trying to run it on a separate, on a dedicated, on try to run it on software on a CPU. Reconfigurable logic can also be useful, um, but in general, FPGAs are not that great for mobile because you have to have, you have to keep them RAM powered, which con uh, keeps the FPGA configuration state, which consumes more power, of course. And in general, if you, what heterogeneous systems is also a way where, mo if you look at a mobile SOC, it con consists of a number of blocks which are all dedicated to perform certain tasks. However, in most cases, you can't actually use all those block blocks at the same time, because then the chip would, would get too hot. But basically, you trade silicon area for power, so but instead of trying to make your chip as small as possible, you you use dedicated hardware blocks for functions you think will be frequently required. So what else can we do? If we go back, if we go 
beyond the architecture level. Obviously, we can control dynamic power by turning off clocks for blocks we don't need. I mean, if the, if the block is not used at that time, if we are not decoding the video, then we can, of course, turn off the clock of that block. And then at least the clock tree power gets reduced. You can clock, clock gating can be implemented in several levels. There are most modern SOCs have several levels of clock gating. They have a hardware controlled in inside the inside the um, IP blocks. They have hardware cl controlled clock gates. But generally, there is also a software control where you can turn off on and off uh, specific clocks. Of course, this only affects dynamic power because we are still powering the block, which means there is still leakage power. And if you will. S uh, the result of that is that, uh, yeah, I think I'll show you an example of that. So both OMAP, Tegra, IMX, any mobile SOC you've ever heard of uses this kind of strategy. The exact implementation details tend to be a bit different. So what this gives you is a tree. So you have, this is a very simplified clock tree how in how it works in, in Tegra. So you have a HF, an oscillator, which is generally something like 12 megahertz, which then gets fed as the reference to PLLs, and then um, the, the right on the right side you have the IP blocks which are clocked, and then each of those can have, there's a MUX which allows you to choose which PLL you want, and then there is a post divider to divide down the rate for each, individually for each block. And then there is an enable which allows you to clock gate the block. So what's next? If we can turn off clocks, then maybe we can also turn off power. Of course we can. However, there are some challenges with that. If the domain is idle, we can we can actually save, we can basically save the state, turn off the power, and when we need it back, we, we turn the power back on and we restore the state. Of course, we use MOSFETs so as our way to turn off power, so we have to use then very high threshold voltage. MOSFETs to be sure that that we are actually not leaking our power through the switches we are used to control the. Of course, there is a delay penalty because we have to save and restore context every time we we go through the side power cycle. And of, and of course, this state safe restore is also an operation which costs power. And it's not useful work. I mean, we don't actually gain, we we don't actually perform any useful work there. So we have to know we have to like estimate how long the block will be idle, and based on that, find out if it's worthwhile to actually turn it off. So uh, the point, the, the, the energy break, e even the energy break even point means that you have to, the, the, the uh, state safe restore costs an, an amount of power, so you have to save at least that amount of power for, I for the operation to be worthwhile. So what kind of blocks can we s can we power gate? CPUs, for example, are quite common. I mean, if you have ever looked at the ARM tree, you will notice that most modern SO ARM SOCs allow you to turn off individual CPUs. So you can, even if you have a quad-core system or an eight-core system, you can turn off al al almost all cores. You can, of course, you can't actually turn off all cores. Then you have to have a wake-up logic to wake at least one up again under hardware control. So that means that you have to save all the registers, including all the system control registers, MMU, etc., cache behavior, etc. You can most of the time I think it's implemented in software. I don't know if anyone does it. In theory, you could do that in hardware. I think Intel CPUs might actually do something like that in microcode, but no one, no one. I mean, I have no, I don't know about that for sure. You can of course also. Power gate peripherals. You can power gate your video comp block, your I2C controller, whatever. And there are various ways you can do that because, unlike CPUs, where there's user space software running and you don't actually, you, you, you can't really control what that does, you know your the driver is the only entity which is supposed to touch the registers. So you can just shadow all your register rights. You don't actually have to save, read them from the hardware, and write them back. You can just write them in shadow memory, and want, when you want to restore, you just write back from, you copy the memory back to the register set. Or in some cases, you can only keep the metadata, like for you, what's an I2C controller. If you know the bitrate, you know that's enough. That's the only parameter you really need. You can just reinitialize the hardware. You don't actually have to do a real register state restore. 
other power states we can implement are retention state, which means that, as you can imagine, this retention means that we uh, the state is actually retains the state is actually retained. However, we can lower the voltage to a level where the logic retains the state, but it actually can't run. So that means you are still saving power, but you, are, you don't actually have to do a context safe restore. Um, it requires, of course, dynamic voltage control. It can reduce leakage power significantly. However, it's less fine grade than power gating because the, the regulators are generally off chip. So you, and you don't have as many supply lines as you have power domains. To, like, for example, on Tegra, we, there we ha you have three voltage, three major voltage domains, but you have like 20 power domains, just to give a, a difference. And of course, regulators don't ramp up down immediately either. So there is a delay there as well, which is not that easy. Well, if we can lower the voltage, we can also turn off the entire regulator. And then we even save a more power than just turning off the internal power domains, because we don't have the leakage of the, power, the uh, MOSFETs, which do the power domain uh, control. The disadvantage is obviously that your ramp up down, that there is a long delay to power up the entire, because the voltage, the regulator has to come back to supply voltage, and that takes quite, that takes millisecond or something like that. Depends a bit on the, how fast your regulator is. But in general, it's quite slow compared to power gating, which is orders of microseconds. <coughs> which means that, that delay trade, that you need to be sure that you're gonna stay long enough in that power state to make it worthwhile. <coughs> yeah, so examples are, on Tegra, yeah, this is Tegra 3, we have 14 domains in newer versions, we of course we have more domains. Um, there is VDD CPU, which is the four powers of four CPUs, VDD core, which powers all the, almost all of the other, of the rest of the chip, like the GPU, and uh, that's on, on newer Tegras, we actually have more rails. The, since K1, the GPU has its own power rail and can also be independently scaled. And we don't have retention. We do have retention in the 64-bit Tegra K1. <coughs> OMAP3 has about the same, but it has retention support on both CPU and VDD core, which we, on N9, used, for example, to be able to enter retention when the screen is on, because the screen has, a, has its own memory, so you can basically send a picture to the screen and then turn off the SSC, and the picture will still be there. But turning off is too slow, because you need to be awake when the user touches the screen to actually do something. So, but retention was still workable. Yeah, so how do you implement all these features, or this, how do you implement these te techniques? So the Linux has various frameworks which allow us to, to implement all this stuff. So for the CPU, we have idle, st <coughs> for CPU idle states, we have a framework called CPU idle, which is quite commonly used. Um, it hooks into the idle task, because the scheduler knows when there is no work to be done, so we have an idle task. And it selects the idle state based on how long it, it, it thinks it will be idle. And the, and, s and the drivers can also put the latency constraint, so if, if, you, if, you want, if you require that the system is wakes up in a, certain, in a certain amount of time, then you can, by that way, prevent uh, sleep stages, to prevent the system from entering sleep stage, which, which violate that requirement. So there are generally, there is a CPU idle governor, which is, I think, almost all, everyone seems to use them, almost the same one. And then there is a platform driver, which implements the actual states, all, all the work which needs to be done to enter and exit a certain state. This is kind of used by, even on desktop CPUs, that's very common thing. For peripherals, it's a bit different. It uh, used to be that Linux did not have any framework for that, but th these days we have runtime PM, which is used somewhat, but not, not by no means as widely as CPU idle is used. So there is a runtime PM get and put, there are runtime PM get and put methods, and drivers can indicate using get and put 
if they need a hardware or if they don't or if they don't need a hardware anymore and then there is a framework which can clock gate or even power gate the domain so the framework can have the idea is that the the um, that the power that it that, yeah, there's, another, there's a power domain framework which allows you to group devices in a certain domain and then the framework knows that if all uh, blocks in that domain are clock-gated then we can also consider power gating the domain and doing the context safe restore work. So they are not really widely used and in Android and actually they are barely used a little bit these days but not really all of them. So Android relies on this on what they call on system suspend resume, which is more like the laptop way of doing things. If you close the laptop, let the laptop goes to suspend, which means everything in the system is off. Or like it's, it keeps its state, but it's no longer running. Which is sort of like a very crude way of doing runtime power management, of course. In MIMO, we did all this stuff. We basically implemented the same ideas, but we didn't have the framework. So we basically had our own OMAP specific way of doing that. Um, and that worked very well. We didn't actually have any, we didn't have system suspended resume at all in our, in our phones. And sometimes, of course, a mix is used like 3D is quite, the 3D GPU can be quite power hungry, so that one is then dynamically power gated, but maybe other blocks in the system are not dynamically power gated. So what can we do about dynamic power? If Sometimes the system also has to be awake. The user wants to do something. So we can scale, of, of course, the voltage. If we, can, if we can scale the frequency, and if we can scale the frequency, that also allows us to lower the voltage, which again saves power. Um, there's, you can do that on CPU, which is very common, on, uh, even on Intel PCs. We, these days, the CPU is scaled dynamically. You can also do it on GPU. And also, and also, modern desktop GPUs scale their <coughs> clocks, N not always only for power saving, but also for thermal reasons. You can, in theory, do a continuous or discrete. M most people do use discrete in the sense that there is a fixed amount of operating points. So that an operating point is, the is a voltage frequency tuple, basically. So you, you have a certain frequency points you can run at, and each of those is asso associated with a certain voltage. The difficulty is, of course, policy. How do you decide what operating point we want to run at? Because we don't want to run at the highest operating point all the time because then we don't save any power. However, if 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 more performance is needed, we need to scale up. How do we n know that, and how do, how do we how do we handle that? And the problem is for the hardware people, of course, that means that you have your logic has to work at several clock frequencies, which is not all that easy, or not always all that easy. So how is it implemented in Linux? We, Linux has a CPU freak framework which tries to there are several governors, I'll come to that later soon. So the governor is the block which implements the policy. So the, the, the governor measures stuff or tries to find out what operating point we want to run at. And then there is a driver which actually configures the hardware to run at that decided operating point. So there are a few trivial governors, power save and performance, which basically choose the highest or the lowest. The conservative governor, which is sort of like the power save governor. Um, but the more interesting ones are on-demand and interactive. The on-demand governor tries to keep the system load at 80%. So if the system load goes above 80%, it will raise the operating point. If the system go load goes below 80%, it will lower the clock frequency so that the load gets gets higher again. The interactive governor has is uh, yeah, so the fir the first yeah, all of these are the mainline Linux except for the interactive governor. The interactive governor is comes from the Android world and has never been merged. It's it might have been in staging, but I don't think it has ever been merged. So the interactive governor has the idea of a long term and a short term load. So the it it has a it tries to keep the both of them under a certain level and if the if the short term load is too high then it will actually raise the clock immediately. What Android also does is that they have they don't only use the CPU load, they also try to use hints like inputs 
hints from the input framework. Like if this user touches the screen, that most likely means the user actually wants to do something. So then it's time to raise the clock so that the user gets a smooth user experience. Yeah, so the, the basic problem with this load-based scaling is that it's always reactive. So, be, it, I mean, it, the, you will only change the clock after your CPU load already is above the 80% level, which means that initially you will be a bit slow, and, and then you catch up, of course. While there are cases, like for example, the input, if you use inputs, there are cases where you can you know that you will need more performance, not because of existing load, because the load is still low, but because the user is doing something, for example, or you get a network packet or something like that. So what about peripherals? You can scale those too, of course. Um, there is this device freak, def freak framework, which is very similar to CPU freak, but for drivers, but it's not used much. I think Samsung uses it, but that's about it. I don't know any anyone else. Who uses that? Um, that? It also has governors very similar to to what uh, CPU freak was, and there are lots of ad hoc mechanisms. Like most GPU drivers, implement their own mechanism for and um, mechanism uh, for load based scaling. So, how do we balance power versus performance? Like I said before, only. Um, not gonna cut it. So that's why there is this PMQOS framework, which basically al allows you to have uh, quality of service. Basically, it's a list of parameters, and then you can vote on them. And it, there are notifiers which m have the notified, which are hooked into by the relevant subsystems to prevent scaling. So how does this implement in practice? In OMA3 and my mode is N9 and N900 to be used on demand governor and we also have our own core DVFS. So the Fidelity core is scaled, has only two operating points. And we use some PMQOS extensions to ha ha handle that. And we also have a link between the CPU DVFS and the core DVFS. If the CPU frequency is high, then we probably want the core to be fast because we the CPU needs to fetch needs to fetch data from memory and that's part of the code. In Android, yeah. So for Tegra, we have our own shared clocks mechanism, which I can't, which I won't go into detail because it's put be too much time, I think. <coughs> and we also have this link between. That's kind of common to do. So what can you do in user space to save power? Rule one is avoid polling. And it's kind of quite a lot of people seem to not realize that polling is a useless thing to do because polling of, of prevents us from entering a sleep state. So that's a very bad thing to do. Also, timers are annoying because if you have lots of timers running, which are not really synchronized, then you will get random wake-ups. Even if you have, if you have five applications running a second timer, but one starts at exactly the second, and the second at five milliseconds later, and the third at twelve milliseconds later, then you suddenly get three wake-ups. While if you would aggregate them, you have only one wake-up, and the wake-ups are expensive, so you can save power by trying to patch those times. Cool. Obviously, release unused resources. If you don't need it, then there's no, break no reason to keep it open. Because then, if you close it, then the hardware might decide, oh, it's no longer needed, let's turn it off. Um, yeah, of course, radio use battery uh, level. Uh, do you use login? We, yeah, mobile devices, we don't really have login. Okay. So that's kind of, yeah, I'm not sure, uh, some of these things. Yeah, so I'm not sure if I'm going to go here. This might not be that useful. Yeah, so, I, maybe I should dive, go quickly into the measurement details. I think we still have, we still have some minutes left, yeah. Yeah, so how do you measure power? Because of course, how do you know you're saving power? The only way to know that is to actually measure and see what happens. Otherwise, you're never going to know it. So the typical strategy is to have a small resistor in the supply line. You can do that either before or after the regulator. Both, both cases are useful, so, so often you, have you do both. Uh, you measure at two points. Um, of course, you also need to measure the voltage because your voltage can most of the rails are 
have dynamic voltage scaling, so you need to change that. You need to. You can either use a discrete mes measurement op amp and ADC. This is what we did in MIMO. Or there are also these TI chips, which are kind of common. They are basically do all the measurement for you. So they have the op amp and the ADC, and they are hooked up via S C So unfortunately, they are not very fast. But that's then does does not really have to be a big problem. Yeah, so the point is that you want to measure as many rails as possible because you want to be able to pinpoint exactly where the power is going. If you only measure like the supply inputs for the entire system, you know basically nothing, not much at least. So how do you de debug this? This is kind of tricky because if you start turning stuff off, then you can't access it anymore. And how do you know it's coming? So JTAG helps, but JTAG, most JTAG debuggers are very confused if you start turning off cores because they have no idea, hey, wh what happens? Um, F-Trace is quite useful in... I'm not sure if people are familiar with F-Trace, but it's uh, the Linux kernel tracing framework, so you can trace system call, you can trace internal function calls, events, etc. So uh, it's from 3.3? Uh, yeah, something like that. Uh. Yeah, so the, qu uh, the question was, was F3 is introduced in 3.3? I think it is. I'm not exactly sure when it was introduced. Isn't It's fairly recent, though. Uh, well, recent? No, I think it's a few years already. It's quite useful, though. Um, then some chips have, most chips actually have hardware observability, which allows you to export internal signals to the outside world. You can use that also to find out what's going on. But that might not be available to everyone because at least in Tegra these features are disabled on production parts. <laughs> they are only enabled in uh, development <coughs> chips. But on OMAP we, we use that quite a lot to, to debug this stuff. And of course, good old print game here, what if uh, no, nothing else works then. Well, what is a UAR? Uh, serial port. Uni oh, yeah. Universal asynchronous receive transmit. So any questions? We have five minutes left. I managed, mostly. You mentioned um, uh, what can we do in software to on the CPUs and device peripherals mm -hmm. to save power, uh, but you didn't really uh, touch on the GPU. Uh, no, I no. Okay, there are some things. I'm not entirely sure how if the the well the GPU do GPU drivers do do so sort of scaling internally. Um, what I'm not entirely sure is if you can write OpenGL or CUDA in a way that it's more if well it obviously if you manage if your code is more efficient then that will improve power because you can do the basic you can actually you can either run at a lower clock or you can race to idle so you you run your process uh, fast and then you turn I it off. What I'm about is that on Linux we lack uh, kind of support uh, that uh, uh, on Windows is especially on NVIDIA GPUs for example on Windows the NVIDIA G the GPU automatically activates uh, when you have like intense computations, like for example, uh, you yeah. a game or that something, it automatically launches. On mm -hmm. Linux, you have to do this uh, kind of manually using Bumblebee, uh, and uh, that was my question. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, can you do that? Um, I guess I don't know actually. I haven't looked at that part of the graphics stack. My guess is that it could be done, but I guess it requires either X or Wayland to have support. So you, what you are trying to refer to is this Optimus strategy, where you run on the inter internal GPU and then you switch. Yeah, yeah that's... Um, first of all, I don't think it's as automatic as it looks like in Windows. Um, I'm pretty sure that they do that based off of Waitlist, of uh, various things they know. They probably games. do, yeah. Or possibly um, they look at like a frame rate measurement or something. Oh, well, it's actually pretty uh, automatic, because... There is a whitelist, I think, though. Because, uh, for example, but if you launch a process in Firefox that requires uh, more power, like a uh, flash game or something like that, it, it automatically kicks in. So it might do a frame rate measurement, yeah. So the real problem is, of course, that if you have that, that you have two different GL stacks. So it's kind of so it's changing the. I'm not entirely sure how they even do that. I to have like no idea how it's how you do you change a running program to a different GPU because you you would have to like copy. The state, yeah, I'm not sure and that, that seems kind of tricky. Firefox <laughs> might be doing something with WebGL, but you can't just take a game, like like let's say we we start up some Windows game and it's running on your Intel code. Taking that game and just swapping the GPU out from under it is not really feasible. OpenGL, well, first of all, they're going to pull all sorts of extensions. 
that's going to ask questions about the driver, and if you switch it out, then it's going to try to be doing one off of extensions that it doesn't have, and this is going to be causing a major problem. Um, so in terms of, from the, from, for something like Firefox, they may be doing something, they may be launching WebGL in a separate process, and if they're doing that, then Windows may be picking up on, hey, look, now we're learning a WebGL something or other. Um, I'm not sure exactly how they're keying that. In terms of the Windows system level on Linux, um, Optimus is kind of, it's a good, they, they've done a good job of what they have to work with, which isn't a whole lot, honestly. Um, the restrictions there on how the drivers are implemented makes that actually very hard to do. Um, in the Wayland world, it will be a little bit easier. It's still not going to be dynamic and automatic. Um, but you could quite possibly have something built into your compositor that picks up on certain executables and hands it a different GPU based off of how it's launched and various other things in the environment. Um, for instance, you could fairly easily detect anything that gets launched by Steam and run it on the, on the screen. Card. Yeah, I guess in theory, if you would not have, if you would do something like take like A1 with an on chip Kepler and an off chip Kepler via PCIe, I think then in theory you sh it should be doable to actually move them. If you run the same driver. Yes, you have to run the same driver, yeah, but we do run the same driver, so. <laughs> but yeah, there are still limitations though, because there are some things you can't do on, a, on the little Kepler in hardware, so that might, it might still may not be that easy as you would think it is, but it, it sort of sounds feasible. Yeah, that's that's the wake up thing I was trying to refer to. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that is a tool called PowerTop, which measures these wake which measures wake ups for you. So then it gives you how many interrupts per second are caused by your process. That's quite useful. I think someone has been doing did a talk about that, but I missed it. So that was me. That was you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's a useful tool. Also, we use something similar on mobile as well. We had a similar tool which allowed us to indicate how long power domains were on, for example, which you can also relate to process and user space activity. More questions? The question might be a bit complicated uh, to explain something. Um, uh, actually, I'm using an Ubuntu 14.04, and in that, if I use an open source driver, and I generally don't play games, so there is no need of uh, uh, GPU for my for my work. So, if I am using an open source driver, then my laptop battery sustains for about two hours, and oh uh, no, uh, for about one and a half hour. And if I use the NVIDIA proprietary driver, then it sustains for more than two hours. So, like, even if I am not using GPU, why the driver is making a difference to me? Yeah, so the, re the reason for that is that the op open source driver does not do any clock scaling. I did, that's, I, I think, I'm not sure that that's the ent entire reason, but at least part of the reason. So the, the NVIDIA proprietary driver does do clock scaling. So I'm very sure they clock it down when it's not really used, while the open source driver doesn't do that. I'm not sure if that's ever going to happen. I hope so, but it's not, unfortunately. It it's, be it's, par it's partially because they... Uh, maybe I'm not sure if Nvidia is now finally helping out on that, but they, it's partially because they have no idea how that works. It's also not so easy. I mean, you have to. The clock is also used to drive the memory. So if you change the clock, you have to recalculate. Or you have you have to use a different set of memory timing parameters, and you have to we do that in the right can't order. Shut down the GPU entirely. That is not needed. Actually, you can't. Uh, if you use Bumblebee, then you can. If you have an internal one, yes. Then you can. Otherwise, you can't because then you don't have a screen anymore, right? No. If you have, if you have, if you have two GPUs, an internal one yes, and a, I have two GPUs. then then you can do this switching, yeah. Okay, yes, using Bumblebee, you can actually specify like whenever you want to run it, you just opt-in run your insert name of program there. Uh, and if you use, I'm not sure what's the package name. On I think it's Bumblebee dash Nvidia. Uh, if you use that, your your GPU. Your NVIDIA GPU will be turned off. Uh, 
unless an until I run it or tell him specifically? Yes. Yeah, so there are also, another thing related to this topic is that uh, depending on the, there are various ways they do that actually, this uh, dual G, uh, GPU setup. And sometimes, in some implementations they have basically a mux after the display outputs, and then you can basically mux the output from either card to the screen. But a um, more common implementation is where the Intel GPU drives the panel, the LCD panel of the screen, and the HDMI port is driven from the NVIDIA GPU, which means that you cannot turn off the NVIDIA GPU if you use HDMI because then you don't have anything to drive it. And if you render, if you want to use a NVIDIA GPU to render on the internal panel, then you have to basically render it uh, in, NV in GPU memory and then copy the resulting frame buffer to, to the Intel side so it gets displayed. Yeah, we have one minute, I'm not sure. Final last question. Mm -hmm. So via, uh, we need some circuitry to keep, uh, uh, so that uh, when I need to start that module again, yes, so it should keep track of that. So yeah, so the, yeah, the, so that is, yeah, so, so that will also require some power. Yes, so that how, does. How does it so what they do is that there is there is a there is a what they call always on domain, at least in, in Integra we call it all, always on domain. Um, which is, as the name says, always on. As long as, soon, as long as the system is on, then we have that. And that there is a little, th there is always a little bit of logic required. So, um, fortunately, that doesn't need to be fast logic. So we can use high VTH transistors to to try to minimize power in that area. But yeah, that that you are you're not going to be able to turn off everything, of course, because you need to wake up at some point. Mm -hmm. That, so there will always be, that's true, that there will always be, uh, for example, if you want to transparently turn off the chip, then you have to have at least a clock running so that when the next schedule tick happens, the system comes back. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I think we are done, or are there more questions? I think we ran out of time, so... Yeah, that's it.